Okay, so <clears throat> we um, were discussing the um, angular momentum budget that can hold in the upper branches of circulations that are angular momentum conserving when the Rossby number approaches one uh, and when, where they are driven by eddy stresses when the Rossby number is much less uh, than one. Um, again, let me, um, oh. Reemphasize this point that, um, again, it's important. When a cell which conserves angular momentum starts becoming cross equatorial, we have these upper level easterlies that develop over a broad region in the tropics. Um, the eddies that do transport, affect transports of angular momentum are barotropic Rossby waves that propagate in upper level westerly flow. So there is already a hint here that cross equatorial Hadley circulations might be more angular momentum conserving because the appearance of upper level easterlies shields them from eddies originating from the winter hemisphere higher latitudes. Okay? Okay, so then let's go back. Questions? No. Let's go back to the aquaplanet simulations. And here I am looking at a lot of fields. I know that this is a very packed slide. But here the important point that I want to emphasize, this is what the circulation looks like before monsoon onset. And before monsoon onset here, I really may mean this very short-lived time. This is, of course, the shallow mixed air depth simulation where things are more or less symmetric above the equator. And after monsoon onset, I'm picking a time where the monsoon is really well, uh, well developed. Um, so again, going back to what the uh, circulation looks like, notice how here, when things are symmetric about the equator, the circulation is characterized by two cells that again are almost symmetric about the equator. The southern cell is a little bit uh, stronger um, than the uh, northern um, cell. Notice how the gray contours represent angular momentum contours. We said that a circulation that conserves angular momentum is such that angular momentum contours and streamlines are aligned. We clearly see crossing of angular momentum contours by the circulation. So the circulation is not angular momentum conserving. And in fact, the color contours that show at the momentum flux divergence in red and convergence in blue clearly show that this um, cells are in fact very much in the limit of a small Rossby numbers, eddy stresses really constrain the strength of the circulation. These are again the large scale eddies originating at higher latitudes. They propagate in region of upper level westerly flow. Once they start approaching the critical line, the zero in line, the break, and again they extract momentum from these flanks of the circulation and they converge to higher latitudes. So let's see what happens, you know, just more or less 20 days after, I think it's 25 days after uh, this, um, this snapshot. Um, and notice how in 25 days the circulation really has changed quite rapidly from this more equinoctial pattern to this social pattern characterized again by just one single strong cross equatorial uh, Hadley circulation. Points to notice is the fact that um, if you can see angular momentum contours now are not vertical, which is what you expect if angular momentum is dominated by the planetary component. But in fact, they are, they take a horseshoe shape and they follow, at least in the ascending and upper branch of the circulation, they primarily follow the streamlines of the flow. So this is a circulation that approaches way more strongly conservation of angular uh, uh, momentum. Um, so why? Why is that the case? Again, the fact that as the circulation becomes cross-equatorial, upper level easterlies start appearing really plays a very important role because again, the circulation is shielded by the zero wind line uh, from the influence of the eddies. So most of uh, the, especially where the circulation reaches its maximum, it's really in a region where there is very little eddy momentum flux uh, divergence. And so here the argument is that this uh, monsoon transitions that we see in the absence of any lensy contrast are really driven, basically they represent transitions in the leading angular momentum budget in the upper branch of the cell from an eddy driven um, regime where again the circulation is really slaved 
uh, to the 80s to a regime that is much more angular momentum conserving in much better agreement with the angular momentum conserving theories that Jeff discussed. So the question is why is this transition so rapid? Why does the circulation intensify so rapidly? In these simulations there is two feedbacks that operate on very short time scales. Again, the first one is associated with this interaction between the mean flow and the eddies as the circulation becomes cross-equatorial, upper level easterlies develop. The easterlies shield the circulation from the eddies and so the circulation can become more angular momentum conserving. As it becomes angular momentum conserving, you really shift to a much more non-linear dynamics, advection by the circulation really becomes dominant. Again, remember that from angular momentum conserving theories, as the circulation becomes cross-equatorial, you develop through thermal wind balance this reverse meridional temperature gradient. So um, temperature maxima are not found near the equator. They're in fact the minimum in temperature near the equator and a maximum uh, um, at the location of the power branch of this circulation through convective quasi-equilibrium arguments, this upper tropospheric temperature structure is related to the lower moist static energy structure. We clearly see this, the equatorial minimum is not, so, um, I mean, it's not really a minimum, but you definitely see a much larger values in moist static energy in the boundary layer in the subtropics where the edge of the Hadley circulation is. And so now, as you start developing this reverse meridional temperature gradient in the lower branch, the circulation itself uh, through advection of temperatures really allows very rapidly to push forward, even further forward, this maximum in uh, the uh, moist static energy. That is to say that the circulation can intensify and broaden very rapidly. And again, here the key is not the fact that land warms up faster than an ocean because we don't have the difference, but it's the fact that the lower boundary that here it's a swamp really can allow for these rapid shifts in the distribution of the moist static energy and in fact can help push the maximum in moist static energy at uh, subtropical latitudes and with it the upper branch of the circulation and associated precipitation patterns. I had a question before asking to what extent this maximum coincides with the maximum in solar insulation. It does not. Solar insulation maximizes at around 23. This maximum is in fact occurring at about 30. Later in the simulation it actually goes all the way to 30 degrees north. So here the interaction and the advection provided by the large scale circulation becomes dominant. And again, this is also a caveat in this argument that really emphasize the fact that we need to know the uh, distribution, gradients, maximum, moist static energy to say something about the large scale circulations is that because this is a couple problem, it really provides that a mechanistic but not a prognostic view of monsoons. We have to run simulations or diagnose uh, fields to be able to look at these interactions. It's very hard to make any prognostic arguments um, based on this. Okay, so uh, very, very short um, summary. Uh, the aquaplanet simulation suggests that rapid monsoon onset um, and then correspond to transition in leading angular uh, momentum budget in the upper branch of the cell from an equinox regime where the influence of the eddies is large and really the circulation is constrained by angular momentum budget to a monsoon circulation where the role of the eddies is minor and the circulation can approach um, more closely conservation of angular momentum. As a caveat, this is based on an aqua planet, right? Uh, and it totally neglects the zonal asymmetry. So I think that there's going to be more discussion next week at the workshop as to how these mechanisms should be modified to include zonally asymmetric, sorry, asymmetric continents. Oh, sorry, zonal asymmetric continents. No, this is Katrina's talk, sorry, yes. <laughs> so this is right. So more discussion about what happens when you start introducing some lengthy contrast. Again, to keep things simple, we just impose a, a continent that is completely zonal asymmetric, but then how these mechanisms are also modified by the presence of stationary eddies that I've completely neglected here when you do have zonal asymmetries. And also I have a poster on where we discuss a little bit what is the observed angular momentum balance in the South Asian uh, monsoon, whether this transitions from a more linear to a non-linear angular momentum budget is seen also in the uh, observations. Okay, so then the other thing that I wanted to do, uh, because I'm sure that there's gonna be a lot of discussion next week on the moist static energy budget is, okay, we said that in the 
to the extent that a circulation is completely angular momentum conserving, the zonal momentum budget reduces to a trivial balance, equal, zero equals zero, that is very verified for any strength of the circulation. So what constrains the strength of the circulation? And so a lot of progress has been made in that by using the moist static energy budget. But again, it's really the relevant budget for moist circulations. And in fact, in many ways, it's really the theoretical development uh, to these quasi-equilibrium views of the interaction between convection and large-scale circulations that I discussed earlier. So how do we obtain a moist static energy budget? We talked before about the dry thermodynamic budget, so that is the, just the first law in thermo of thermodynamics. Jeff, I'm sorry, but I'm going to use primitive equations here. Sorry, pressure coordinates, I should say. Um, so the first law of thermodynamics can be written, uh, so I'm just rewriting in pressure coordinates, Cp, d temperature, d time, minus 1 over rho, d pressure, d time, equal to any heating rate. Okay? This is the first law of thermodynamics we should all be familiar with. So when we write it in pressure coordinate, then we have Cp. I'm going to expand the uh, material derivative. We're going to have a horizontal temperature grade. And it turns out that you can combine the vertical advection of the material derivative on temperature and this term in just one single term that is equal to omega, which is the vertical velocity in pressure coordinate, omega being dp d time. And then here, what appears is the dry static stability, that is the ds dp, with s being the dry static energy. We discussed a lot about the moist static energy. It's just CPT uh, plus GC. And that is, I should have written it. Sorry, let's do this. Um, and this is equal to the heating rate. OK? Again, this is a stability. It's basically d theta, dp, a linearized form of uh, stability related to the brun weissler frequency. There has been a lot of work that is being done by using the dry thermodynamic budget. Once you know the distribution of the heating rate and the distribution of the precipitation pattern, so look at what um, large-scale flow is consistent and generated and driven by the diabatic heating. But again, the problem here is that it's diagnostic, but it's not prognostic. Again, once you introduce the perturbation, because the distribution of the precipitation is strongly influenced by the large-scale patterns, there is nothing that this uh, budget can tell you. Okay? So then how do we make progress? Then we combine this. We're going to vertically integrate this. And I'm going to just denote vertical integral like this. Um, and I'm sure that I'm going to miss a few things, but that's how we write it. Again, I'm just dd time, vertical integrated temperature, plus the, again, u, this is just the horizontal wind, so this is just the horizontal induction, okay? Plus the omega, the SDP term. And then what are you left with when you integrate the heating rate is how um, fluxes, radiative fluxes or surface fluxes can change your, basically, um, uh, your temperature. And so we're going to have the vertically integrated diabatic heating due to condensation plus sensible heat from the bottom. And then you have net shortwave fluxes. And here what I mean the net is the difference between the net at the top and the net at the surface. And then you have the same for long wave fluxes. Again, net difference between net at the top and net at the bottom, OK? So then we're going to take the moisture budget, and we're going to do something very similar. We're going to use it. Again, these, of course, is written in energy units. We're going to do the same for the moisture budget multiplied by the latent heat. So we're going to do LV dQ dt plus the horizontal advection plus the vertical advection, omega dq dp. And this will have to be equal to sources and sinks, right? Sources minus sinks. 
then you vertically integrate, and then you obtain LV DDT of Q plus the horizontal advection plus the vertical term. And then what are the vertically integrated sources and sinks? You're going to have the condensational moistening. We call it QM. And then you'll have evaporation from the surface. So, so latent heat from the surface. OK? Then we're going to sum these two. We're going to sum the vertically integrated dry thermodynamic budget the vertically integrated moisture budget, and we obtain the moist static energy budget. Let me call this equation one. This is equation two. Taking one plus two, we obtain the moist static energy budget. So we have a term, which is the storage of enthalpy in the atmospheric column which is CPT plus LVQ. Okay. Then we have the horizontal advection of the same quantity, vertical integrated, CPT plus GZ. Sorry, the vertical integral is here. And then we're going to have a term that represents the vertical advection our favorite quantity, which is moist static energy, because it's the sum of the dry static energy coming from the dry thermodynamic equation and the moist term. Say it again? No. I'm sorry, LQ. Sorry. Yes, yes. There is no GZ there. Yes. Um, there are. So there are different ways in which the moisture budget is derived. Some start from a statement that moist static energy is conserved. Um, at the end, you get to something similar, but this is really the correct way to derive it. And in fact, in the advection and in the storage, you don't have the GZ term. If you start from a statement that moist static energy is conserved materially, then you have the extra GZ term. Doesn't make much difference. That is a very smoothly varying term, but that's the correct way to derive it. And then when we sum the sources and sinks of energy terms, we're going to use the fact that these terms that are the largest terms that appear in the dry and moisture budget actually cancel each other. Okay? So we're going to use the fact that the condensational heating, which is equal to LV multiplied by precipitation, is equal to minus the condensational mass staining. So the two are the biggest term in the individual equations, but they cancel each other, so they completely drop. So now we don't have any information that is related to the diabetic heating anymore. And the sources and sinks are really our sources and sinks of moist static energy coming from the top of the atmospheric column and the bottom. And so these are going to be equal to what we call the F net or net energy input into the atmospheric column. And these are equal to basically the top of atmosphere, radiative fluxes. Again, those contain the downwelling shortwave and the upgoing long wave, minus the surface fluxes. And the surface fluxes, in addition to the radiative fluxes, also contain the latent heat and the sensible heat. Is it clear? So we're really just saying that whatever is the net energy input that can enter an atmospheric column through radiative fluxes at the top and radiative um, turbulent surface enthalpy fluxes at the bottom will have to be balanced by these other terms that are associated with how the dynamics respond. So it's really, again, bypassing this, the large diabetic heating terms. And it's really related large-scale circulations to the energy sources and sinks in a vertically integrated sense. OK? OK, so then um, approximations that are usually used in the moist static energy budget are the following. 
Steady state, so we neglect any storage. So we're gonna assume steady state. We also are gonna make use of the quick temperature gradient approximation to at least to a first order drop the horizontal advection terms. Notice how the weak temperature gradient is of course justified for temperature, it's less justified for moisture. But we're gonna say that we're gonna do it, okay? So we're gonna drop that. And so then the balance that we have, so steady state, weak temperature gradient, then we are going to say that the leading balance, and that is true in the deep tropics, is between the vertical advection of moist static energy and the net energy input. Again, if this is my atmospheric column, the net energy input is whatever comes through the top and the bottom, okay? So then we also are going to assume that in the tropics, so far I haven't introduced any time averages. I've been a little bit sloppy about that. But we are going to assume that in the deeper tropics, really, the vertical advection is not dominated by eddy covariances between vertical velocity and h. It's primarily dominated by mean vertical motion. So again, I'm going to now put the bar. And assuming that the HDP bar is positively stratified, exactly as I showed you before, the fact that H tends to be, on average, larger at upper levels than at lower levels, which means that in pressure coordinate this will be negative, then what this balance is really stating is that whenever the net energy input is strong as positive, what the atmospheric circulation will do, which means that you are actually gaining heat um, through the top and the bottom, the atmosphere will respond by diverging energy away through the development of vertical motions such that omega will also be negative. So the way in which the circulation responds is to develop strong vertical motion in the atmospheric column. If you assume, and that is also a consequence of convective quasi-equilibrium, that really the dominant vertical dominant mode is a mode in which the vertical motion is characterized by one simple structure with maximum in the metroposphere. And then you have lower level winds and upper level winds confined to relatively thin layers close to the surface and the bottom, and they basically are opposite sign to each other. Then the, the picture that you develop is that you have lower level convergent motion. These converging motions are converging moist static energy that is smaller than the moist static energy that is being diverged away by the upper level motions. And so in this way, you can reach a balance, again, by which the net energy input coming through the top and the bottom is balanced by the circulation that is exporting moist static energy through the development of vertical motion. Okay? Sign, yeah, and again, this is also where you also use using the assumption that the, the horizontal winds are primarily confined to thin layer close to the top and the bottom, so that when you take a vertical average, is really basically the difference between the H at upper levels minus the H at lower levels. And the H at upper levels is larger than the H at lower levels. There is a lot of caveats that go into this, and that's where we also are right now, moving a little bit away from convective quasi-equilibrium. To what extent this is also true that always true that convective motions have a deep baroclin first baroclinic mode structure. There is evidence in the tropical Pacific of, in fact, circulations in which the expert is occurring at a much shallower level, where in fact you are close to the minimum in moist static energy. And you can still have convective rain bands, such as the one over the Eastern Pacific, that in fact is importing rather than exporting moist static energy. Because again, the, um, in this case, when the return flow is at lower levels, so let's say mid-levels where the moist static energy reaches a minimum, the lower level converging motion is exporting, importing more moist static energy than the one that is being exported by the uh, mid-level motion. But these are things that are being uh, 
we'll get to them next exactly. week. Exactly. Next week, I'm, I'm, there is a, there is going to be a lot of um, discussion about this. There are a lot of different definitions of equality, which is the gross moist stability. I'm sure that the gross moist stability will be used extensively. And the gross moist stability can be defined in many different ways, but it really is a measure of the vertically integrated export of moist static energy by whatever circulation you have, normalized by the mass convergence at lower levels. Again, here, all these arguments are based on positive gross moist stability, also called GMS. But again, there is a lot of work that is being done these days to understand how, how good of a representation of many tropical rain belts, uh, the assumption that, positive, that gross mass stability always positive is. OK, so um, another point that I want to emphasize that goes back to how we should really think about the and I should mention that really the first paper that introduced the gross moist stability is also a quantity that um, is really powerful to, for instance, model tropical precipitation is milling and held. 1987. And honestly, we haven't done a whole lot of progress since that paper in understanding what really controls the gross moist stability. Obviously, this has to do with the interaction between convection and uh, large-scale circulation. Probably I gave you the idea that we have all figured it out. It all, it's, all about, it's all about convective quasi-equilibrium. In fact, it's really not, not the case. Okay? There is a lot of active work that is really trying to understand where all of these assumptions um, based on convective quasi-equilibrium really break down and when we need to consider deviation from um, convective quasi-equilibrium. Okay, so the other thing that I wanted to say, again, because uh, it really, oh, maybe I shouldn't, okay. I think it really makes uh, the case for how the moist static energy is really the budget that we need to consider, for instance, when thinking about monsoonal circulations. Um, is the, is the following. Again, the net energy input is the difference between top of atmosphere radiative fluxes minus the surface fluxes, okay? So the surface fluxes are also the ones that control the surface energy budget. So now I'm thinking about the surface energy budget of a mixed layer, but then we'll talk about that, how that gets modified, for instance, over uh, land surfaces. Let me call just big C <coughs> the heat capacity of whatever mixed layer I have. So the surface energy budget is just the statement that storage, let me call it TS, in the mixed layer depth. So how temperature can increase in the mixed layer depth will be a result of the surface fluxes. And again, notice that the surface fluxes are taken as positive when they warm the mixed layer, that is the surface. We have to switch sign when we consider what gets into the atmospheric column. And then possibly, if you have ocean heat transport, there will be a convergence of ocean heat transport here, okay? Okay, so over land, there is of course no transport. And also, because the heat capacity of land is small, then this term on any time average longer than a few days will drop out, OK? So land is really different than the ocean in terms of this moist static energy view in the fact that, again, on time scales of a few days, the surface energy fluxes are constrained to be zero. Okay, so the net energy input into the atmospheric column is really dominated by the top of atmosphere radiative fluxes. Okay, and so for instance, this is why over monsoon regions you have through seasonal insulation forcing a strong source of energy through variations in solar insulation. Okay, and so it's the atmospheric circulation because no heat can go into the surface that need to um, redistribute those, that energy input from regions where you get a lot of energy to regions where you are losing energy, okay? So that's why we get strong monsoonal circulations over land. It's really not the land sea contrast per se, but it's the fact that surface energy fluxes are constrained to be zero over land. Over the ocean, 
Now, a lot of that that comes from the top can be stored into the ocean through storage or can redistribute it through the circulation. So the ocean can dampen out the atmospheric response, which cannot happen over land. So this is, again, beautiful series of papers by Chu and Neeling. I never know how to say Chu, Zhou, and Neeling, early 2000s. And again, de-emphasizes, again, the view of monsoons as really driven by near surface temperature contrast, which should really be thinking about moist circulations that want to export moist static energy. And we should really be thinking um, about them more through um, this view that emphasizes, relates the circulation to the top and surface um, atmospheric energy fluxes. OK, so I am left with 15 minutes. Um, I'm trying to decide what I'm going to do. I think that what I'll try to do is be a little bit more clear as to um, the consequences of thinking about monsoons as uh, um, really cross-equatorial um, hubly circulations and also um, trying to tie back these energetic arguments to, for instance, the main position of the ITCC, which is north of the equator, and possible shifts um, during the monsoon season. Um, let me do one more thing at the board, sorry. Um, the moist static energy, one flavor, it's really I'm restating the same things that will make it a little bit more clear the connection between the moist static energy budget that I've just described with this view that is trying to link shifts in the ITCC position to cross-equatorial energy transports. If now we take a zonal mean, um, and I'm going to indicate the zonal mean in this way. And I'm going to also neglect storage, although the storage could be, in fact, effectively included in the net energy input. The moist static energy budget has been, um, can be rewritten as uh, the meridional divergence of the zonal average of the vertical integrated total meridional moist static energy transport, and this needs to balance the net energy input is exactly the same concept. I'm just averaging in the zonal direction. And again, I am relating any region of net energy input to divergence, that is export of moist static energy through the development of a divergent circulation. OK, so now we can integrate from the South Pole. You can do the same from the North Pole, in fact up to a latitude theta. And we're going to use the fact that at the South Pole and the North Pole, there is no meridional energy transport. And so we can express the energy transport. Again, here, it's really the total. You can decompose into an amine and an eddy contribution at any given latitude theta as 1 over the cosine of theta, the integral from the South Pole to that latitude theta of the net vertically. Sorry, this is also zonal average. I'm also going to take a zonal mean of A cosine of theta in D theta. Again, you can do the same from the North Pole. And this is really just to say that if the net energy input is completely hemispherically symmetric, then you cannot have a cross-equatorial energy transport. You can have a cross-equatorial energy transport only if you have asymmetries in the net energy input between the north and the, and the south pole. And this then, going back to the schematics that is really relevant to many things, including the northward shifted position of the ITCC in the annual and zonal mean, again, going back to why is the ITCC north of the equator, is really related to the fact that there must be an asymmetry in the net energy input with the northern hemisphere receiving more energy than the southern hemisphere. And the question is exactly what is it? Is it through top of atmosphere fluxes? Is it through surface fluxes? As John discussed on Monday, it's really not through the top of atmosphere radiative fluxes. In fact, the uh, short wave term is remarkably symmetric. Um, the long wave term, in fact, 
is such that if anything, just based on top of atmosphere considerations, you would expect the ITCC to be south of the equator. The northern hemisphere radiates very efficiently in desert regions. So again, if the ocean didn't do anything, the ITCC would be south of the equator. And this is confirmed in idealized simulations that we've done in our group where we covered the northern hemisphere with just a very simple land and without any ocean heat transport, the ITCC is sitting south of the equator. So the reason why the ITCC is north of the equator is because the ocean heat transport is transporting energy in the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation from the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere, in fact, in excess to what would be required by the top of atmosphere radiative imbalance. And so now that excess of energy that is transported into the northern hemisphere by the ocean needs to be transported back by the atmosphere. And the way the atmosphere does it, again, is by shifting the ITCC in the northern hemisphere. And again, here, these are just showing schematics that are shown before. Again, in this framework, northward shifted um, ITCC position is accompanied by um, cross equatorial energy transport in the opposite direction because, again, the Hadley cell on average is an energetically direct circulation and transports energy in the direction of the upper uh, level uh, flow. Um, so, this framework, um, Sarah was really uh, influential in the development of this framework, really emphasizes how the ITCC position is anticorrelated with the cross equatorial energy transport. If we include any perturbation to this already zonally asymmetric present day climate configuration that, for instance, puts more energy into the northern hemisphere than uh, a northward, more northward shift, shifted position of the ITCC will be accompanied by an increased uh, southward uh, cross equatorial energy transport. I'm sure that another thing that will be discussed a lot next week is the energy flux equator, which is a proxy for the ITCC that again has been developed based on these energetic arguments, again, to the extent that the circulation has this structure, moist static energy has this very simple stratification, then the position of the ITCC, that is the dividing boundary between the southern and the northern cell, is where the mass flux, but also the energy flux, will go to zero. So the ITCC in this uh, framework has been argued to be, if not necessarily collocated, at least co vary with the energy uh, flux equator, again, where the energy goes to zero from being southward in the southern cell, being northward in the um, northern uh, cell. Um, so um, this anti-correlation between the ITCC shifts and cross the changes in cross equatorial energy transport has been shown to be robust in GCM simulations forced <coughs> through different forcings. This anti-correlation is shown here. This is the annual mean ITCC change as a function of the changes in the annual mean um, atmospheric cross equatorial energy transport. And uh, um, with uh, a sensitivity of, so you need to, to obtain a three degree shift in the ITCC position, you need one petawatt of change in cross equatorial energy, energy transport. Okay, so let me emphasize how, uh, while this uh, energetic framework has really been used extensively to understand annual and zonal mean shifts of the uh, ITCC, there's still a lot of open questions. The first question is to what extent is even this zonal mean framework useful? in the sense that to different forcings, is it true that in different monsoon or ATCC regions, um, is the zonal mean uh, framework indicative or representative of any different sector means? Um, the verdict is still out there. I don't think there is any agreement that has emerged yet, and there is a lot of work that is being done with um, different uh, GCMs more or less idealized. Of course, again, here we have totally, um, exactly as I did for the zonal momentum budget, we don't have any consideration of zonal fluxes, zonal shifts in the precipitation. So how do we extend this theory to account for those? Uh, um, and there has been recent work that has taken steps uh, forward in this direction. And then the other big question is, here really we are assuming that a big assumption in all of these arguments is that um, um, shifts um, in the ITCC are primarily due to changes in the mass flux of the Hadley cell without any change in the efficiency with which the Hadley circulation is transporting energy. Um, and it turns out that uh, that is not always the case. We cannot assume that the gross moist stability and the efficiency of energy transport 
is always constant. This is work that Sarah has done uh, looking at the response uh, of the IPCC to CO2 forcing. We've also looked at changes in the gross moist stability through seasonal cycle with aquaplanet idealized GCMs. So it's important to keep in mind that again, sometimes the Hadley cell adjusts to radiative perturbations, again, not by shifting its ICDC, but actually changing. It's hard to change the moist static energy stratification, but you actually can change the Hadley cell vertical structure, for instance, through the development of um, return flows that don't go all the way to the deep tropospheres at level where the moist static energy is large, but can in fact occur at the levels of minimum gross moist stability. Therefore, changing the sign of the gross moist stability. Okay? And so in these situations then, um, cross-equatorial energy transport and ITCC positions are not associated or related in any um, linear um, ways. Okay, or anti, no, they're not anti-correlated. Okay, so the, if I can have two more minutes, the final thing that I wanna do is talk about the existence of tipping points in monsoons. Two minutes, um, it's not even my work, uh, but I thought it would be interesting. So, uh, so how we define tipping points. So these are really, really very somewhat broadly defined again, will or can we expect that monsoons will shift rapidly from very different states, let's say wet and dry states, for small changes in radiative forcing past um, a critical threshold? And there has been some work that has argued that as the total top of atmosphere albedo gets above 0.5, monsoons will totally shut down. Um, there is evidence in paper records of rapid changes in monsoon. I will also say that probably there's going to be discussion next week as to what extent these paleo records are really providing evidence to rapid changes at a specific location or more gradual changes of patterns that have rapid uh, spatial patterns. So again, this is something that is to these days being discussed in the literature. So why should we be thinking that monsoons have tipping points? And I think that the argument that has been used is the fact that Monsoon onset is a very nonlinear process. Can these nonlinearities that act on the seasonal or subseasonal time scales also act in response to a given um, changes in, in um, um, enforcing? And of course, the, here the concern is that through land use changes, maybe aerosol, maybe increased greenhouse gas concentrations. Um, the monsoon will shut down. Okay, so of course, usually the tipping points are studied in very simple models. Um, I won't present work from previous work, but I'll primarily focus on recent work by uh, Bill Boos. And he used a simple model that is basically just the moist static energy budget that we have described. Actually, he has two equations for temperature and moisture, vertically integrated. Those should be thought as fluctuations, perturbations in temperature and moistures. Again, we have the vertical terms that represent the body cooling and the low-level moisture convergence. Meridional winds are assumed to be proportional to the meridional gradient. The sign is the low-level flow. Simple closure for precipitation. Um, you have an heaviside function. Well, let me, first of all, there is observational evidence that precipitation is strongly related to how much moisture you have in the column. Um, and then, um, so precipitation increases with moisture in the column, but decreases with temperature. If the temperature becomes too warm, uh, the column becomes too, too dry. And then you have a, a relaxation time scale and a heaviside that, first of all, guarantees that precipitation is non-negative. And again, that tells you that when you have too dry and too warm atmospheric column, precipitation will not occur. No rotation, no nonlinear momentum of action, no evaporation. So in this simple model, actually, you see, and the solutions for precipitation is the blue, um, and the, the solution for the wind um, is in red. Again, when you combine these two equations in one single equation for um, you actually find that the relevant parameter is, again, the net energy input into the atmospheric column. This is this Q parameter here. And again, you see that there is no evidence of any abrupt change in the monsoon. There are some maybe nonlinear increase of VNP as Q is positive. Once Q becomes negative, again, this is the net energy input into the atmospheric column, no precipitation, and then the circulation reverses sign. So how do we explain the absence of tipping points in the simple models with previous work that have argued for the existence of tipping points? So previous models, especially this paper by 
Leberman et al. basically used some similar arguments as the one provided by the Moist static energy argument, but they neglected some key terms in the, in the resulting equations. They neglected the vertical term in the dry static energy budget, that is the adiabatic cooling, that is also the vertical motion that sustains uh, precipitation. They also neglect completely the lower level convergence. The dress retain the advection by rotational flow uh, of moisture, and they argued that that is the relevant nonlinearity for the monsoon. So to test that that is indeed the case, that it's really not accounting for these terms that are so important and that really represent our current understanding of moist circulations in the tropics. So then here, what is being done, you take the same model and by basically pulling the dry stability, the DSDP term that is cast before to zero, then you obtain the following solutions. Basically, as Q decreases past this threshold, you basically, your monsoon completely disappears, okay? So again, here, the, what I would like to emphasize is that, um, again, our current understanding of monsoons um, <coughs> is not in line with the existence of tipping points. Uh, and I'll stop here. <laughs> <laughs>